So, uh, short introduction to Dielsa. So, uh, she's a researcher at the ICD. And um, yeah, her research interest lies in using computational methods and co-design and developing on ontologies that improve the interoperability and multidisciplinary architecture design. So, and you come from the Bauhaus University, yes. you have a master from there, and you has also have a bachelor in architecture from the MIMA Sinan Fine Arts University in Istanbul, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. So, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Moritz. You're welcome, thank you. So, I don't really need to introduce myself. In any ways, I'm Dielsa, and my research is under the supervision of uh, Professor Thomas Wortmann. Today, I will, uh, wait a second. Today I will give a talk on BIM with knowledge graphs, uh, where first I will try to define the word ontology, which will include the knowledge graphs, semantic web technologies, and then uh, we will see how these technologies could improve interoperability in the ESC industry. And then finally, I will demonstrate how such work looks like with a tool that we are developing together with Bureau Hapold. I would like to start the presentation with a question, what is a column? And the answer probably depends on whom we ask. Because we know that an architect might define a column as a volume and the structural engineer can define it with a two points and the, the line in between and some other, um, some other properties. But it is important that we know that there are always different perspectives and always different definitions of the same physical object. And for example, if we look at this image, we can see a railway and we can see one, one physical asset, one infrastructure component, but there are different, three different ways how it is represented. A geometrical representation, but at the same time we have this 2D uh, electro, electrical engineering domain representation and the one from the logic and how it works. So which one is the right one? All of them. Because there are different ways how we need to represent data and what actually we need to represent. And such discussion brings us back to the aphorism attributed to the statistician George Box, who says that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And which is true, because whatever we model, we are basically, if we model a building, a building element, for example, a column like here, we are not actually really talk, we are, we are modeling a representation of a physical asset and that is not exactly the physical asset. It's the representation. For a point of view, a standard, a discipline, but since all models are wrong, it is very important to know what to worry about. And to put it in other words, it's important to know which information do we need to represent. So the question of how to represent knowledge, how to define what an object is, what, what is worth being modeled, and to which level of detail we need to extend, there is a science that deals with this, with the definitions of uh, objects and entities, which is the ontology, which are ontologies. And what exactly ontology means? Uh, the ontology is basically the science of what is, of what kinds and structures of objects are, and how the structures are related to each other. And the word itself, ontology, comes from Greek, ontos being, and log logos study. Here we can see a small ontology on the chart, where we have a parent, a child, and their role as a person or parentship. So this simple, simple form here is modeling a relationship between a child and a parent. If you look at the Google definition to see what is an ontology, we can see different definitions. The first one is the branch of metaphysics dealing with the nature of being. And the other one, the second one, is the set of concepts in a subject or area or domain that shows their properties and the relations between them. But the topic of ontology, of defining what is one element and how we represent information, is not a topic that was born in the 21st century. This is a very old topic that dates back to ancient Greek and even before common era. We have here the theory of knowledge from Plato, where Plato put, where also other, um, where also others try to define, but in this case is the theory of Plato, where he tries to define the knowledge and makes a structure to the epistemological comparison between science and opinion. And he tries to put there that they are humans, 
they have thoughts, they have soul, but they are also some a physical object and tries to find this relation with a physical body, but also the thoughts and beliefs. But this definition of ontology and this kind of explanation is more related to the philosophical uh, ontology that is used in nowadays and not exactly the one that is in computer science, even though there are some overlapping. Now, if we try to define the philosophical definition, what is an ontology? Um, in ontology in general, it is still the, the study of what exists, but there are some, some examples of philosophical definition of ontologies are what are the fundamental parts of the world? How are they related to each other? Are the physical parts more real than the immaterial ones? And for example, here we have the, are the objects such as shoes more real than the concepts of walking? And what is the relation between shoes and walking? So we still define this objects and, and relations, but this is more to do with the thoughts and the objects, the physical and non-physical objects. Over time, there were two major branches of philosophical ontology. One of them is the ontological materialism, and the other one is ontological idealism. The first one, the ontological materialism, is a perspective, a belief that the material things such as particles, chemical processes and energy are more real than, for example, the human mind. The belief is that the reali reality exists uh, regardless what the human observes. And the idealism is the different, is that uh, the belief is that uh, the, the, the human mind and human conscious is more real than, for example, the material things. So this reality is actually constructed in the mind of observer. But that said, this is not the definition that we actually use directly in data science, even though there are some overlapping. So in computer science, an ontology is the data model that represents knowledge as a set of concepts within a domain and the relationships within, within these concepts. But in line with a um, with, um, philosophical definition, an ontology is a formal naming and definition of types, properties, and interrelationships of entities. So that really or fundamentally exist, and not only on the mind, for a particular domain or discourse. And this in practical is the, um, this combined with the classification and taxonomy defines the ontology in computer science. So ontologies, as we said, are this kind of schema that defines the objects and relations. And the ontologies are used in knowledge graphs as well, where a knowledge graph is a graph structured database model that we can link and integrate data. And the knowledge graphs, they consist of this T-box where we have the ontology, the schema, and the assertions where there are the objects, the project specific data. And we can also have rules of, this, of the same uh, ontology or knowledge graph. Here we go back to the same ontology, a person like a child and a parent. So if we talk about the child and a parent, a person, parentship concepts, these belong to the ontology. But if we talk about an actual family, then we are talking about the assertions. And then we can have rules. For example, we say uh, every person is mortal, then we can infer that also a child and a parent, which are person, are mortal. So, now we can define what is a knowledge graph. And so the knowledge graph is actually, we have an example of a knowledge graph when we can see different people that, that have diff, that had visited some places and then this place is a city. So we have defined here the two T box and A box, how they are related to each other. And what is very interesting about knowledge graphs is that we can query quite, um, is this a pointer? I do, it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. So what is important here is that we can see that there are, all these nodes are connected to each other, but with knowledge graphs, we can really query information from very, we can query information from, um, for example, we can query something like, what is the place that a person who is friend of Bob visited? Like we are having this database of Bob and Bob is friend of Alice and Alice visited Eiffel Tower. And Eiffel Tower is a place, so we can actually query very different information from different databases if they are all connected in a knowledge graph. 
So we can define the knowledge graph as this collection of interlinked descriptions, which put in context the data, they, are, they link the metadata with each other, and they provide this framework for data integration, unification, and analytics. So can we, so that, that is, then what is very, very uh, powerful about knowledge graphs and also the technology that provides this knowledge graphs are the reasoning that we can actually have this, like the one that I mentioned, if we say that every human is mortal, then we can infer a lot of new knowledge. Here we can also add some new rules or we can add some different information, which actually will help us to infer some new facts. And then these new facts might infer something else and then might infer something else. Then we start with a simple data, but then we end up with a lot of other information that we might not be aware of because they come from different disciplines, different requirements. Then we end up with new facts. So all this technology lives under the umbrella of semantic web technologies who are who enable to create data stores on the web, build vocabularies, write rules. And there are, there, here is the stack of semantic web technologies, how are they related to each other and how it is built on top of each other. Now we have the standard data model of the semantic web is RDF. And RDF is structured in simple triples where we have subject, predicate, object. Just like in the graph that we saw, Alice is friend of Bob. So then we have all these relations and entities with each other and then we can query information across platforms. And now if we want to actually position these technologies in, and the knowledge representation in the overall data science world, here is a chart of artificial intelligence and different approaches. On the left side, you can see the sub-symbolic approaches, which are the well-known one, machine learning, deep learning, neural network. And on the right hand are the symbolic approaches, which are the logic-based approaches. And knowledge representation is actually one of them. And it's there, it's there with description logics, with reasoning, deduction, first order logic. And one way to represent knowledge is using knowledge graphs. So if you try to position knowledge graphs in artificial intelligence world, knowledge graphs are a way to represent knowledge. Knowledge representation is a symbolic approach of AI. Now, if we want to look on a history of knowledge graphs and how different ideas, how different uh, technologies were, in, were discovered and why, why the, until we reach to the knowledge graphs that we have today, we can see many different technologies one of them being semantic networks as one of the early technologies, and which is also graphic notation for representing information. Then later alongside we have the frames, logic programming, then we have the foundation, then, then we have also in parallel the object entity models, then uh, later on we have the formalization of RDF, which was the standard data model, and after 2000s, we have also the, 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 the Sparkle, the query language of RDF was formalized, followed by graph databases such as GraphDB, and then we have Wikidata and the knowledge graphs that we are using today. Now we see all the beauty of this technology. Now we can think how could they solve some architecture, engineering, construction problems? Could they solve some of them? And we know many problems in the building industry, and some of them are the digitization. The construction industry is basically not so digital. Then the second one is that projects require multidisciplinary solutions, and data are very heterogeneous, so we need to integrate them. Then another problem is that how we actually define data. How do we define the schema for a specific discipline, and how to make it uh, interoperable with the other discipline? So talking about the digitization, I've been checking some highlights of different uh, platforms complaining why the building industry is not adopting digital transformation. Why is it one of the least digitized? Here I came across this article from 2016, which lists construction industry as one of the least digitized industries, leaving only agriculture and hunting behind, which is actually a bit ridiculous. Like, but this is anyways mainly referring to the actual construction site and not just the design part, but still that is a crucial part of the building industry, so it's actually not so pleasant to see this chart. And now when we go back to the multidisciplinarity, 
which basically is the crucial part why data is not integrated, why, why we don't have, why the schemas are properly not working, we can see that there are a lot of disciplines involved and a lot of, they, then data is, the, and the building industry mostly adapts a linear design process where different disciplinary data are considered separately, sometimes in different times, and data are used, this data is not on, interoperable, but we know that the most critical design decisions, they happen in the early stages of design. And they don't only influence construction costs, what most of the time we hear the complaints about, but they also um, have a big impact on the subsequent building energy use. Therefore, here at the Cluster of Excellence, we are trying to rethink architecture digitally and trying to find a way to integrate this data under the umbrella of co-design but also Moritz mentioned, where co-design def is defined as an integrative approach that considers design and analysis methods, manufacturing and construction processes, as well as material and building systems simultaneously from the early stages of design. And this data, of course, needs to be integrated, but it is federated in its own discipline. And that is actually a big challenge because thinking of a building, there are a lot of actors involved and data and requirements of each other are interdependent where each stakeholder has a specific way to store and represent information. While a structural engineer can represent a building as a whole of columns, beams and slabs, an architect would view the, view the columns as we said, of the 3D elements, but would idealize a building as a collection of spaces. So now such disciplinary representations are actually crucial because they allow also to do disciplinary analysis and find the most optimum solution for your own discipline. But that becomes a bit problematic, how to model building data, how to find a common language. And now if we, there are of course some technologies, even though building industry apparently is not so digital, there are still some digital information and we still have the building information modeling, which is BIM. And uh, in my selection of words, BIM, building information modeling, basically refers to the process of creating and managing information for a built asset. So we are just representing geometric and semantic data of a physical asset. But the role of this BIM information should not only represent information, but also allow us to interoperate and exchange between disciplines. And nowadays we actually really encounter most of the time the term BIM alongside IFC, but I wanted to listen here some other uh, when, so a timeline since to show that BIM is actually a quite old word. And the concept of BIM dates back to 70s where the first software, uh, where, where the first software tools developed for modeling buildings emerged in the, and then we have some uh, modeling softwares that emerged in the late 70s. Then we have also Chuck Eastman's building description system. So what I want to try to differentiate here is that the industry foundation classes is a data schema to build information modeling, but is not equivalent with BIM. BIM is a broader term and has never, it's, it's not part of IFC. So there are, there are also other ways how we represent data and IFC is the industry standard and it's, um, it's the schema of, that is based on the express data model and the IFC files are used to exchange data between BIM software. Then we have also other different platforms that allow this data communication and also representing information. Speckle is one of them which is a web-based platform and allows real-time collaboration. Then there is also BOM framework, which is an open source framework that allows data interoperability and also representation of building elements. There are also many more, but here I listed these three ones that kind of are both of, both all of them are trying to represent information and also exchange. Then IFC, what is the, what is the drawback of IFC is that it represents data in a monolithic approach. And that is a big problematic part of, I, of the building industry because there is no uh, single entity, a single uh, structure that could convince all these parties to agree on one single definition of building elements. So that the schema of IFC is contradicting with the nature of, of the building. And the second uh, big problem is that it's quite rigid. So it's actually not extendable. It's, the standard itself is not extendable even though the 
file formats can change, but still it is quite rigid. Then talking about Speckle, Speckle mostly focuses on connecting software rather than representing. That's why it has uh, not a large number of object models, but it actually tries to connect different softwares with each other. And BOOM, in this case, is trying to do something different. It provides multiple discrete representation of building elements. Therefore, it has a very rich object library. And at the same time, it also tries to, it has a lot of adapters to map data and translate among different softwares. So in this case, if we try to position themselves, th these three approaches, and, and um, this analysis where we have, where we check the distribution or centralization of data interoperability in terms of their database model, data schema, and data exchange format. There can be decentral <coughs> distribution in different uh, layers, but in uh, building industry, we mostly encounter distribution across all layers, that everyone uses the schema that they want. All the disciplines have different ways that they decide to represent their data. And uh, this mainly happens actually in industry via file transfer. You send a file and there is no latest uh, update from everyone because it's very distributed and free. On the other hand, we have the, uh, the, the approach that everyone uses the same schema. And this is the typical example is the IFC where everyone agrees on the schema and then data exchange is easier. Then the other part is that we have federated different tools, but these tools share an ontology like they all have their schema, but they have also something in common where they map their concepts. And the frameworks that I just mentioned actually could correspond to Speckle is distributed, IFC centralized, and in this case, BOM is more federated. Even though it doesn't have the shared ontology, but it has some mapping processes. So from this point, we decided in our research at the university, we decided to work on top of BOM and try to extend BOM and bring semantic web technologies in the BOM framework. And the main reasons was that it actually had a data dictionary, so we don't start from scratch building all the ontology. And the second, this data dictionary is actually extendable, and we can um, def define our own objects. And it also provides multiple discrete representations, so it provides this federation. And also it has adapters to link different softwares. And also from the structure of the framework itself, it's quite similar with knowledge graphs, like separating the types and objects and also the rules. And it works with visual programming languages. So it was quite a good overlap with the overall goal of the project. The only problem in the framework that we saw was that objects like the same, the same object, for example, here a wall, which can be a panel, it can be um, an analytical, different representation of a wall. They are mapped to each other, but they are not linked. So we tried to solve this with semantic web technologies and together with Bureau Hapoil, we developed uh, some components for Grasshopper and also other softwares that uh, BOM supports. And to convert all these uh, BOM objects to a graph-based database model to RDF. And um, now here, this is a bit too fast, but here is a visual representation how we could design in Rhino or Grasshopper, then we can convert this data to RDF, we can directly connect to a graph database and query the information and apply all the beauty of semantic web directly from the design platform. And there are different, um, different a lot of um, advantages of using semantic web technologies which uh, could basically integrate data, different concepts, link data with each other. The second, we could also augment different um, objects with more semantic information, and we could also infer knowledge across different uh, databases. And oops, here, mm, this is going a bit. Here is, for example, an ontology containing also the classes and entities and all the objects that uh, need to represent this simple building where we have a ceiling, a wall, some columns, and a floor. And there we see how the graph of the building corresponds. Then to apply this toolkit and to see the results, how it looks like we, in the summer, we organized a workshop together with Daniel, Professor Stab, Thomas Wortmann, and the supporters from Bureau Hapold, Alessio Lombardi, and um, Al Fisher, we hold the workshop and we had over 100 applicants. And in the end, we worked with around 20 participants. All the lectures and all the tutorials are already online. And there we have different 
And there we tried to dem demonstrate how this tool could work, but we already came up with some very interesting results. Like one of the projects was urban ontology, and there was a group who tried to define the ontology within, first they defined the ontology among themselves, then they tried to design these objects in Rhino and Grasshopper and convert this information to graph and applied some very interesting query and uh, questions that actually could not be directly understandable maybe from their initial data. Like here I put the example of one of their queries which would find all, they had a city, the city has buildings, point of interest parks and roads, and they tried to find all residential buildings without access to park within distance 250 meters. And this information could help them to redesign or replan the city. Then the other group tried to combine, uh, tried to build a material ontology and to combine different representations of what exactly is a material. They had some render parameters and some texturing data and tried to build it as a material recommendation system. And they also uh, tried to see how this could be. Like for example, they tried to find all materials with transparency larger than 80 and a reflective ratio that is 1.3 while they have stiffness. So actually this with knowledge graphs works quite good. So they try to combine different, to find if their design is meeting the requirements. Then we also try to exemplify this research at the cluster of excellence. Here is a, some validations of data that we try to do at a shell structure of the in CDC. And we try to see if uh, we modeled all the design in Rhino, then convert it to a graph, then we check, for example, if we can, if all the building elements have material assigned in. If not, then we continue working on the particular parts that don't have a material. Or here, for example, just from the information of the volume and the material, we could infer if, if, we have, if we know that all these parts will be lifted by a KUKA robot, which has a lifting capacity, then we can check which, actually which um, cassettes cannot be lifted from the robot. Now, we are a big team now working in this project. It's, uh, we have also a student assistant since some months, Aaron, Thomas, my supervisor. We have the engineers from, uh, from Bureau Hapoid, a software engineer, Alessio Lombardi, the head of computational development, Al Fischer. Then we have also Daniel Hernandez from the Institute for Analytic Computing, Institute for Parallel and Distributed Systems, and Professor Stefan Staub. And um, so far we have published three papers about this work and we are working on two more to publish by the beginning of next year and all the code and example files are open source on GitHub and uh, we are still working on it. There are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of problems that we see on the way. We have some problems with geometry and with, uh, we are debugging the, also the tool itself all the time, but we all believe that combining design tools with semantic web technologies can increase the use of knowledge graphs and not only improve interoperability, but also assist design decisions through reasoning and would improve in general the building industry. So, yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any question or you would like to know more about the project, please feel free to contact me or anyone from the team. Or just ask questions right now. <laughs> um, yeah, I have one question. Um, what do you think about, um, I mean, here we get the real flexibility with uh, BOM and uh, with the RDF and, and the ontologies, but um, it's always a lot of um, yeah, work to be done, uh, develop, developing work. And um, what do you think about um, hybrid systems, like hmm? hybrid systems mm -hmm. uh, where you have like um, a, a small core uh, uh, represented by um, IFC, maybe also ontologies, on the other, uh, on the one hand, and 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 then we have more flexible um, ontologies or, or BOM. I don't know <laughs> the difference here exactly, but um, to combine those technologies, how do you yeah. see this um, approach? Yeah, I. That's a very good question. Thank you. 
at that actually it's that what tries also the federated uh, the federated approach to do because right now we don't really need not all these tools need to be in BOM or not all these tools need to be a specific standard. What is important now what we described but that is also a little bit flexible. What is important is that we want to have a common database model. So we have everything in knowledge graph, in RDF, but the way how we come to the knowledge graph, that is not actually very crucial. But th that is not the key part, so it's not actually defined. Now we are demonstrating it with BOM, but if we convert all the information of IFC to RDF, then we can basically directly link it with the information that we have. So we have different information from different disciplines, from totally different softwares, convert to RDF, then we can work with it directly in knowledge graph. So that part here needs to be like we have here the knowledge graph, but what the schema is, it's not actually very crucial. So the goal is to have the common database model, some alignments, like to define that an IFC column is actually a BOM column. And if we have this link, then everything works perfectly fine, like the graph that we saw, Alice knows Bob. I, I have the intuition that the hybrid, hybrid model you are proposing is the same that the federated. So m my understanding is that the hybrid model you are talking about is something similar to the federated, because it includes, so in when we have the different data models in, in the web, we have some big models. For instance, Wikidata have a lot of data and this general knowledge, yes? But then you go for some database for biologists and they have specific knowledge that's only for biologists and they overlap in some concepts. So you have an animal that is described in the biologist and also in the Wikidata, but it's more precise in the, in the biologist area. Yes? Or they have a vocabulary that is different on that area. But then you want to combine some difference. So if you have some part of the building that is standardized with IC, with I, I, yes. IFC. IFC. <laughs> and another part that is standardized with a particular a new language or new vocabulary that is defined for the people on the project, maybe here in the university, you can combine them. It's not, it's not an issue if you can, you, you can make a, a bridge between them. So in the story of, of ontologies, you, you have some group of people that try to define the ontology of everything <laughs> in the world. So they started saying that there is a thing, then there is trying to go for up to down and the other people that are trying to go down up. So they define the specific concept and then they try to link them to the others. But at some point you need to, you have different topics and the idea is to how we federate and how we establish these links between the spaces. So I think that your average is somewhere, some like federated, mm -hmm. but then there is the other issue is that the issue of the data model, yes? So in the data model, the typical tools use uh, geometric models. And there are other tools that use uh, different raster models and different models, and then you need to combine them. Of course, if you, if you want to modify images, you are not going to represent the images as a graph. So this is, this is another, another problem that is still a problem, but it's, it's, so one is the, is, the, is the problem of combining different graphs, and the other is the problem of combining graphs with other types of objects that it doesn't work to convert them to graph, but you can include them in the graph to manage different mm, type of data. So that, that is probably the reason that now graphs is, are being used for many companies to link different, re even relational databases or that are typical in some cases because they, they provide this way to represent entities uh, in different databases. So it's, it's, it's the, the way that they manage the heterogeneity of the data. Thank you so much, Yelza, for your talk. Um, you know, I'm a historian, <laughs> and uh, the semantic web um, gives a lot of space for reflection on, um, let me say, competing terms. Um, a column, what is a column? Um, is it uh, something different from a pillar or um, is there a historical layer to something? So I wonder a little bit, is there uh, an option for a critical ontology? You know, um, you open the field very wide, um, like with an example of um, how far is the next um, public 
screen you have access to, um, perhaps at what hour, um, access for, for whom. Is, is there a chance to have all of this kind of, um, let me say, three or four dimensional sort of information inside? Yeah, thank you. If I, if I understood the question correctly, that is, that is actually very crucial because the ontology itself, for example, the, exa the, the ontolo urban ontology that we showed, it was a one week workshop with students that were exploring the tool. But if we want to define an ontology and the rules and say that every person needs to have access to a supermarket within five minutes and needs to have access to a school within 10 minutes. If we define this walkable cities, then there, we need domain experts actually to define this ontology. And this cannot be done without any critical reflection of what actually makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So in these terms, the semantic web is providing all the foundations to use it, to query the information, but the ones who are specifying the ontology and the ones who are specifying the rules that the ontology exists, they should be domain experts and they should together agree on a domain specific terminology. Can I understand is that like each element or whatever information, right, is linked with all other elements or does a person or whatever, you know, decide the rules to which elements one element should be linked? Hmm. I think that is again, like one element is basically not linked to all elements, yeah. but to some specific ones. So a person decides that? The person who is defining the ontology. So right now, if I go back here to, there are, I should have shown maybe some existing ontology, even like the IFC schema, IFC schema is also an ontology. And in IFC, we can see a column is a subclass of something. So a person who is defining that ontology decides who is related, what is related to what. And then here that we had the, the simple person, child, parent, parentship ontology. That is a simple example, but if we check of friend of a friend ontology, that is an existing one. And then we can see all the relations that can exist. And you can just add information about actual persons, but that already exists. And to define new ontologies or to extend the one ontology, there are different works. For example, in computer science, there are many uh, other researchers that say this ontology doesn't really satisfy the requirements that we have. So we want to add also this new relations. Then we can customize it for our own purpose. And that is actually what is happening now at the cluster because there are some existing ontologies, but we want to add some new relations. And would it be useful maybe for someone in another university? It might not be because the setup that we have here is quite specific. So then a person or let's say a collective agreement for a certain purpose can define one ontology.